The following is a presentation of Castleview Church in Indianapolis, Indiana. We all have family traditions or cultural customs that we observe, some that we think about, others that we just practice without much thought. From what we eat on certain holidays to the fact that we have a best man stand next to the groom at a wedding to the blessing that we pronounce anytime anybody sneezes. Those are all customs or traditions that we inherit. And you might have found yourself wondering about a certain custom or tradition. When did that get started? Where did that come from? You're not alone. And later on today, not right now, but later on, you can look up traditions that you're curious about. You can find a host of interesting sources, including about the best man. Don't look that up now, but you can look that up later. Um, if you've been around church much, you know there is there are certain traditions or certain customs, and one of the most noticeable ones is a special meal that Christians observe. Across denominations and across cultures throughout the world and across time, Christians celebrate the Lord's Supper together, or communion, you might have heard it called, or the Eucharist, depending on your background. These are all different names for this meal, and that's what we're going to look at this morning in Mark chapter 14, the origin of of that custom or that tradition. It's not something that we just wonder, well, where did it come from? We don't know. We can't find the source. We find its source, and its source is Jesus, who himself instituted that meal. Mark chapter 14, verses 12 through 25 is our passage this morning. You can listen or follow along as I read. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room that I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready there prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. And when it was evening, he came with the twelve. And as they were reclining at table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and to say to him, one after another, Is it I? And he said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. And as they were eating, he took bread. And after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. And they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. The most important part of this passage is that celebration, that meal in verses 22 to 25, when the, Jesus shares what's called the Last Supper with his disciples, a meal that would then be repeated by future followers of Christ, one that we repeat here our practices every month on the first Sunday of the month in the Lord's Supper or communion. But before we get to the meal, we have that set up in verses 12 to 21, and it highlights God's plan unfolding through human actions. So the context here, it's time for the annual celebration of the Passover, this Jewish religious feast and it was to be observed within Jerusalem, within the walls of the city. So Jesus and the 12 disciples have been outside of Jerusalem in Bethany, a little ways away. And they need to come and the disciples say, where, where will we celebrate the Passover? Where in Jerusalem is it going to be since they weren't in Jerusalem? And Mark gives us the instructions that Jesus gave two disciples. They're to go into Jerusalem and they're going to meet this unnamed man who's carrying a jar of water. And he's going to lead them to some master of a house. And when they meet him, they're going to say, the teacher says, where's my guest room that I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he'll take them to a large room. It'll all be ready. And that's exactly what happens. Now, these instructions, when you read them, you think, what's going on here? Is this a, is this a prophecy? 
that Jesus makes? Is he predicting this supernatural appointment with this man? I think that's, I think that's a possibility. That could be read that way. I think it's also possible that Jesus' instructions here just indicate a prearranged plan that was communicated to other individuals in Jerusalem. There's going to be a man carrying a jar of water, which many think would have stood out because women were those who carried the water. So this is a man at a certain place going to be there, and he's going to be their key, their sign that they should go with him. And the secretive nature of these arrangements would make sense that that would be necessary in light of the fact that there are religious leaders plotting actively exactly how they're going to destroy, how they're going to arrest and then kill Jesus. But in either case, whether these appointments were miraculous or whether they were prearranged, everything that happens leading up to Jesus' arrest and his death is part of the plan. We keep seeing this over and over again, and we see it here. And that plan includes the actions of human agents, both good and evil. They are all part of that plan, working toward God's appointed end. And that point is driven home at the meal when Jesus tells the 12, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. And it's shocking news. And they're very grieved by it. They're very sad about this. And they start asking, is it I? Is it I? Now, you might know from other gospel accounts, Jesus indicates in privately to, to John and to Judas more specifics about who it is that's going to betray him. Of course, Judas already knew since he was the betrayer. But Jesus' answer to the group is not specific, which is what Mark gives us here. He just says it's one dipping the bread into the dish with him. And in the next breath, he makes this interesting comment, the Son of Man goes as it is written of him. The suffering and death that is now very imminent has been foretold and foreshadowed in the scriptures. It has been written, and now it is coming to completion. It is coming to reality. And in this context, I think Jesus is probably alluding back, in particular, to Psalm 41. In Psalm 41, David cries out to the Lord to save him from his enemies who wish him dead. And there in verse 9, as you see on the screen, he weeps that it's one closest to him that is among his enemies, even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. Well, Jesus' statement here that his betrayer is dipping bread with him, I don't think it's just a random clue. You know, he's, he's wearing a brownish robe. You know, okay, we look around, we try to figure it out. No, he's just saying, it's one of the 12. It's even one who is eating with me. One with whom I am sharing a special meal. His statement speaks to the personal relationship to the one who betrays. A close friend with whom I have shared countless meals and conversations and confidences. No enemy can bring as much pain as a close, trusted friend. Many of you have been betrayed in some way by someone who's close to you. And you know that the, the joy and comfort in a friendship or in a relationship is that you can let your guard down around them. You can trust them. They're safe. You can be vulnerable with them. But when someone uses that trust to take advantage of you, oh man, the pain cuts so deeply. And Jesus knows what that feels like. He had that happen to him. Well, the betrayal here was foreshadowed in David's own life and in the psalm that he wrote. And now David's son, his greater son, as Jesus talked about in chapter 12, he is experiencing the same pain. And Jesus says all of this is part of the plan. This has been previewed in the scriptures. It has to happen. And yet, he declares, woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. And there in that statement in verse 21, the, it has to happen, it's been foretold, it's been written, and yet woe to that man. Jesus stresses both divine sovereignty and human responsibility in the same breath. The betrayal has to happen, but the betrayer is culpable. He is responsible for his action. And our minds struggle to grasp, how does this all fit together? How does this work out? How are these things both true at the same time? 
There are no easy answers. We want to start from a position of humility, accepting the fact that there are mysteries in the universe that none of us can fully comprehend or explain. That's our starting point when we look at deep truths. And we recognize that the God of the Bible is big enough and wise enough to create everything, to even create the existence that we are inhabiting and experiencing at this moment. We didn't cause it to happen. You didn't choose to be born. You exist, according to the Bible, because God spoke the world into existence and he has created each of us. And if God is big enough and wise enough to do that and to even give us minds that can begin to process complex truths, well, this same God, we would reason, might be able to do other things that are beyond our total comprehension. And I think that's what we butt up against when we think of his sovereignty and our responsibility. And the early church embraced both of these truths that Jesus speaks of here. Listen to the prayer in Acts chapter 4. The early church who's being persecuted says, Sovereign Lord who made the heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage, the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. This is all set up to their prayer. He's sovereign Lord. And they citing Psalm 2, the Gentiles and the peoples plotted, the kings of the earth set themselves against your anointed, Jesus. They continue, verse 27, For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. God's eternal plan accomplished in spite of human sin and, most shockingly, even through sinful human actions. In Mark 14 and 15, we're reading the unfolding of the story that the church in Acts 4 are thinking back on months later. Evil men conspiring to perpetrate the most wicked act in human history, the killing of the only sinless man who has, only, who has ever existed, the very Son of God, and they do it all in accordance with God's plan. This means that the worst thing that you can imagine happening to you or the worst thing that you have experienced, the worst thing that you've ever gone through, cannot ruin God's eternal plan. His good purposes are intact. They cannot be frustrated. Our plans are frustrated all the time. My plans don't come to fruition. Right, the psalmist says, the counsels of the peoples and of the nations are frustrated, but his will always is accomplished. His good purposes are intact. Wicked men may intend to do you harm, but God intends all things for the ultimate good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. Jesus' own statement here reminds us of that. It also reminds us that God's plan doesn't mean you're off the hook for your own actions. If you're ever tempted to think that, well, it's all according to his plan, so it doesn't really matter what I do, what decisions I make, what actions I take. That is contrary to what we read in Scripture. You are responsible. You can't change God's plan. It's true. You cannot change or cause his ultimate plans to be frustrated. But you can and should watch yourself and be on guard against sin. Because if you set yourself against Christ, the plan of God will not be derailed, but you might be derailed. Your life might be derailed because you've set yourself against him. You notice here, Jesus doesn't say, you know, it would have just been better for everyone if this betrayer had never been born. He doesn't say that as though the betrayer could mess things up. But he says, it would have been better for that man if he had not been born. These words on the lips of a compassionate Savior are weighty, and they are a warning to us. Well, all of this that is being spoken here is at the Passover meal that they are celebrating. 
So though you might have a heading there in between verse 21 and 22, they're at this same meal, this Passover meal. And then starting in verse 22, the attention turns from the betrayal to this new meaning that Jesus will give to two elements of the Passover meal, the bread and the cup. And these four verses are loaded with significance for Christians. I want to highlight two main things. First, in that Last Supper, Jesus portrays a new sacrifice. He portrays a new sacrifice. The Passover meal that they were celebrating had happened initially about 1,500 years earlier. We think of origin of traditions, origin of this celebration. It went back roughly 1,500 years, and it marked the beginning of the Exodus when God's chosen people were rescued from slavery, delivered from slavery in Egypt. It was the single most important event in history, the Exodus was, and it was all kicked off by the Passover. Now, they had been in slavery for around 400 years in Egypt. The descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they cried out to God, and God raised up a redeemer, a deliverer, Moses. And through Moses, God did mighty acts, sending plagues on the Egyptians, to compel their leader, their king, the Pharaoh, to let God's people go. But time and again, you can read in the opening chapters of Exodus, Moses says, God says, let my people go. Pharaoh says, no. More plagues come, more plagues come. Sometimes Pharaoh wavers and he says, okay, you can go for a little while. You can go a little while. All right, you can leave. But every time he quickly changes his mind and he's more harsh than ever on these slaves. And they remain in captivity through nine painful plagues. And the tenth plague would be the worst. Now, even before Moses went to Pharaoh that first time, the Lord told Moses basically what's going to unfold. These plagues are going to happen, but Pharaoh's not going to relent. His heart's going to be hard. In fact, the Lord would harden his heart. And Pharaoh will not let the people go. It says in Exodus 4, 22, before even the first plague, the Lord says, Then... You shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. And if you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. The Lord, Yahweh, says through Moses to Pharaoh, let my son go, my firstborn son or you will endanger the life of your own firstborn son. And that's what happens in the tenth and final plague. The Lord warned that judgment would fall on every family and each firstborn son in the land of Egypt, including Hebrew sons, would die unless they killed the spotless lamb. According to his instruction, spread its blood on the doorposts and ate the lamb as a family. Because the night of the 10th plague, the Passover night, the Lord would come, and he did come, and he struck down the firstborn in the land of Egypt, including the firstborn of Pharaoh. But he passed over every home where a Passover lamb had been sacrificed, where there was blood on the doorway. God established an annual Passover feast to commemorate this night, the night of judgment and the night of salvation, the night of punishment of a holy God and the, the night of deliverance for all who come under God and under the blood that he prescribed. They came out of slavery by the blood of the lamb. And the Passover began with a meal as it was celebrated in the future. It began with a meal that started around dusk on a certain day in the Jewish calendar. And it was based on the instructions that you can read there in Exodus. And it also then developed a standard liturgy, a standard pattern of how the meal was eaten, of devotions, of songs that were sung. You can read more about that, find more information on your own. But each of these steps in the meal were significant. And when it came to the actual elements of the meal, the food that they ate, they symbolized aspects of their captivity in Egypt or aspects of the Exodus and the wilderness wanderings. And just before they ate, the head of the household would explain the significance of their foods and the connection of the Passover. Maybe you've participated in a Seder meal and you've, you've seen how this happened, but there was a script and the 
the one who was the head of the household would explain how, for instance, the bitter herbs represented the bitterness of their slavery in Egypt. So it's likely here that Jesus has just done this, that he has gone through the traditional explanation of those foods, and now they're eating that meal together. But now it's during the eating of the food that he goes off script, and he adds things and assigns new meaning to some of the elements. He takes bread, he blesses it, he breaks it, he gives it to them, and he says, take, this is my body. No one's ever said anything like this before, certainly at a Passover meal, but Jesus takes the liberty of saying, I want to tell you what this bread is. It's me. And unless you're new to a church, you hear those words and you think of the practice, the observance of the Lord's Supper. The words are very familiar. But on that night, the 12 must have found those words a little bit cryptic. I wonder what they thought when they heard him say, this is my body. They're used to Jesus speaking in symbols and metaphors. But I wonder what they thought when he said, this is my body, as he gave them bread. Well, our thoughts when we hear those words might go, or some of you might think of the debates between Christians over the meaning of these words. Christians for centuries have thought through and debated with one another. What does this mean about the metaphysical realities in the bread and the physical properties, the spiritual properties? Some have argued that the bread becomes the physical body of Jesus. And they say, well, look, we need to take God's word literally. This is my body. This is, therefore, my actual flesh. And it becomes that at the celebration of the Eucharist or the Mass. Of course, we look back at this first meal and we recognize Jesus is physically present with them. So I don't think there's any hint here that they would have considered the possibility that the bread was his actual body. He was there physically present with them. I think they understood that it was figurative. And we also remember Jesus often spoke figuratively about himself. I am the door. No one confused that with a physical door. I am the door. I am the gate. I'm the living water. We take those statements figuratively. And to take them as woodenly literal would be, I think, to miss their real significance and meaning. I think the same is true here. The most natural reading of the text recognizes it's a symbolic meal. But symbolic does not mean unimportant or fake. The meal is significant because the things symbolized and the person represented are of the utmost significance. So what is Jesus saying when he says, this is my body? I like how I, Howard Marshall, compares this meal to a photo. When Jesus says, this is my body, this is my blood, it's similar to someone pointing to a picture of himself and saying, oh, that's me. You see right there? That's me. And we're not talking about the person's physical presence in that photo, but that photo truly represents that person. Right? We think of our own photos, family photos. We treasure them. We, we protect them. We try to back them up on the cloud. We don't want to lose them. We're distraught when we do lose them. When we think about Christ, we don't have a photo of Christ. By God's design, we don't know what his physical face or body looked like. But in this meal, we have, in a real sense, a depiction of him and of his sacrifice. And when we taste and when we see the meal, we see Jesus represented in those elements. Now, for followers of Christ, and including these Jewish disciples here, the priority of the Passover gives way to this new meal. There's a Passover significance, and it's pointed toward this day and this Savior, and now he is instituting a new meal and a new celebration. Our sacred meal does not focus on the Passover, but on Christ. So we don't eat roasted lamb together but we feed on Christ by faith as represented in the bread that we eat. And we receive him as that final Passover lamb. We need his blood just as much as the slaves in Egypt needed the blood of that lamb. And we don't spread it on doorposts, but we partake of it by faith as is represented in the cup. Now, when we have this few verses here and you have these moments that he shared with the disciples, Jesus did not spell out all the theological meaning of these symbols, but the basic focus, the basic thrust, I think would have been clear. 
The death that he's been predicting, remember? For chapters 8, 9, and 10, he makes these clear predictions about his death. This is going to happen to me. I'm going to be betrayed. We have a little hint at the end of chapter 10. I'm going to die as a ransom for many. We see that there. But now he's explaining with more fullness and with a bit more clarity that his death is going to be on behalf of others. And his people will be those who are called to partake of his sacrifice in some sense, to feed on him as symbolized in this meal. I'm pretty sure the disciples did not fully grasp what all this meant, but it was a meal reflecting on the Passover, a preview of the cross, and after the cross, after the events, after the spirit is given, they're able to reflect back and see a fuller meaning, fuller significance to the meal and to what's happened. The meal pointed back and it pointed forward. It looked back to the Passover, but now it looked forward to this Passover lamb who was about to shed his blood for God's people. And like that first Passover, everyone who comes under the covering of that lamb and his sacrifice will be spared. God's judgment will pass over them. And that is our hope as Christians. That God's judgment that we deserve because we are sinful, certainly no less sinful than those who've come before us, than those who experienced that first Passover, we're no less sinful. And yet, by faith in Jesus Christ, we come under his sacrifice and under his blood, and we can be confident that we will be spared the punishment we deserve. If your trust is in Christ, God will not punish you as your sins deserve. If he were to punish you, that would be like double jeopardy. It's already been fulfilled. The punishment has already come on Christ who received it, who took it on himself in the cross. Now the disciples might not have grasped all that, but in time they would understand. After his death and resurrection, they'd reflect back on this meal, on his words, and their understanding would grow. Sometime after breaking the bread and saying, this is my body, Jesus takes a cup. This was probably, again, part of the Passover meal. There were four cups that they would take at different points. Following the meal, it was time for the fourth cup, and he takes the cup, but again, he does something new. He does something different. He says, this is my blood, and he adds, it's my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. So now we see Jesus is enacting a new covenant. In this meal, he is enacting a new covenant. We don't talk a lot about covenants in regular everyday conversations. Maybe if you're a part of like a homeowner's association, you have a covenant or something like that. But we don't have a lot of covenants that we encounter regularly. But covenants are key to understanding the story that is unfolding in the Bible. And they stipulate God's relationship to man. We talk about a relationship with God. We talk about knowing God. We're starting to use covenantal language. Now, depending on your age, you might have heard of a DTR, right? You know what a DTR is? You had time to define the relationship. I don't know if that really is used anymore. Probably not. But we used to talk about, we need to have a DTR. We need to define the relationship. What did that mean? Well, usually it was in a situation where there was a guy and a girl who might be interested in one another. At least one of them wants to know, okay, what's going on here? Who am I to you? Who are you to me? What's our relationship? We need to define the relationship. Well, a covenant brings clarity to a relationship, and it formally establishes the relational commitments of one party to another. So maybe most familiar to us would be a wedding ceremony. Promises are made in front of witnesses, and a relationship, though there is a pre-existing relationship, our relationship is entered into, it is formalized, and the commitment is formalized, and they agree publicly to perform their covenant obligations, love, faithfulness, living out this one flesh union before God. Well, in divine covenants, the relationship is not husband and wife, although it is. It is God acting as husband to his people, often pictured as his bride. The most basic covenant commitment or statement is this. I will be their God. They will be my people. This language defines the relationship. God belongs to his people. 
You, you can say, if you are in right covenant relationship with God, he is my God. He is not only almighty creator of the universe. He is not only one who stands above me. He is one who is with me. This is my God. And to say that is not bold or presumptuous because it's language that he gives us. And at the same time, we, his people, belong to him. We are his. We recognize we don't live in isolation or independence. We are his. And when it comes to God and his people, the relationship is always the result of God's gracious initiative. Why is that? Well, it's because he's holy and we're sinful. He's perfect. We're not. He is good to us. We turn against him. We live our own way. God is not obligated to enter into relationship with man, but he does in his gracious mercy. Now, because of our sinfulness, God has provided ways for sins to be atoned for, to be cleansed. That's why in the Old Testament we find these animal sacrifices. We find this animal blood all over the place. Why is that? Why is this just some primitive thing? You'll find people who will say, yeah, that's, that's old, that's primitive. We've moved past that. We've moved past blood. But according to Scripture, the blood was the basis on which man could have a right relationship to God. Listen to Exodus 24. You can, you can turn there yourself. Exodus 24, we have an old covenant here with Moses as the mediator, God speaking through him to the people. Exodus 24, shortly after he's delivered them from Egypt, and the Lord calls Moses up to Mount Sinai, and he speaks to him, and he gives him his law, what we know as the Ten Commandments, and he makes a covenant with Abraham's descendants, this Sinai or Mosaic covenant. Often we refer to it now as the Old Covenant. And it's on the basis of this covenant that the nation of Israel is born, that it is formalized and established as God's nation. Now listen in these verses. We're going to see things about God's holiness, about the need for blood, the application of blood of sacrifices. We're going to see the blood of the covenant language, and it's going to end with a meal with God's people in God's presence. Look at this Exodus 24. Then he, the Lord, said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. Moses alone shall come near to the Lord, but the others shall not come near, and the people shall not come up with him. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules, and all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young, man of, young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrifices, peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half the blood and put it in basins and half the blood he threw against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of all the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do and we will be obedient. And Moses, Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel went up and they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone like the very heaven for clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God and ate and drank. The covenant was established with blood. The blood from the sacrifices was thrown, half of it against the altar of God, and half put in bases and thrown and sprinkled out on the people. This blood signified the purification and forgiveness that the people would receive from God. And this atonement was the basis for their right relationship to God. And that's how Moses and the elders could, with God's permission, approach his awesome and holy presence and not be consumed. And then it says in verse 11 there, in light of God's holiness, what's so shocking, what stands out, what is worth mentioning is that God did not strike them dead. You see that in verse 11 there? God did not kill them. He did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. Instead, 
he let them behold his glory. He welcomed them into a fellowship meal with him. They beheld God, they ate, and they drank. Probably see the connections here. Jesus is offering himself, his blood, to create a new covenant relationship between God and his people. The blood of bulls and goats served a purpose in that old covenant, but now there's a new lamb, a new sacrifice, and he is enacting a new covenant. Jesus' blood is now the basis of any right relationship to God. There is no other way. There is no other basis. We don't have animal sacrifices, as we've already prayed about this morning. We don't have animal sacrifices or altars in the church. That's not because we've just kind of moved past that. That was primitive. We are progressive and are enlightened. It's not that. We are just as sinful. The reason we don't have those things is because of Jesus' blood that provides everything that those animals' sacrifices pointed ahead to. We have it all in Jesus. And we, like the elders on Mount Sinai, can approach a holy God because we're sprinkled with Christ's blood. We can see a glimpse of his glory as he reveals it through his word. We can approach him in prayer. We can enjoy a fellowship meal with God and his people. And he doesn't strike us dead, but he communes with us. That's only possible because of Jesus. He's the reason we can know God and be in right relationship with him. Our, our, our culture, we often hear the message like, you're pretty good. God, of course, would love to be in relationship with you. You're great. You're awesome. Why wouldn't he want to know you and love you and bless you? If he wants anything less for you, well, that speaks badly of this supposed God. We presume on his grace and our right to be with him. But the truth is that God's son had to shed his own blood for us to know God and to enjoy his presence. Total safety, total protection by the blood. Jesus' phrase there, the blood of the covenant, points back to what we just read in Exodus 24. And it also picks up the promises throughout the Old Testament of a new covenant that is coming. So Jeremiah 31 is one of the clearest places to see it. He says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them up out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people." And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. The disciples and their peers would have been very familiar with this prophetic hope, this new covenant, this better covenant that's coming, because Israel and Judah repeatedly broke the old one. They failed to live up to those covenant obligations. But something better is coming. Something new is happening, and it's happening here in Christ. The foundation of this new covenant, we just read there in Jeremiah, we saw it in Hebrews earlier, will be this. I will forgive their iniquity. I will remember their sin no more. And Jesus has the boldness, the audacity to say that new covenant that you've been waiting for for centuries, it's here. It has come, and... It is established, not in a temple sacrifice, but in the sacrifice of myself. My blood is now the blood of the covenant. Under the old covenant, forgiveness, access to God comes through the blood of the covenant, which is provided in the sacrificial system that God gave to Israel. In the new covenant, forgiveness and access to God comes through the blood of the covenant, but it's the blood of the new covenant, which is the blood of Jesus shed on the cross. So now we don't go to a certain place or to a certain nation to participate in a sacrificial system. Where do we go? We go to Jesus. We go to the one who shed his blood and all who come to him by faith enter into this covenant relationship, this covenant of love and of grace and of mercy, of acceptance. We enter that relationship through Jesus. And if you are in Christ, You are in this covenant. You participate in what Christ has accomplished. 
When we enter this new covenant, we become part of a new covenant community, the church. In the Last Supper and in the new covenant, Jesus gathers this new covenant community, this new people to himself. You think about the Passover. Who was to celebrate the Passover? It was in family units. We had families gathering to celebrate the Passover, led by the head of the home. But it's interesting here that Jesus did not celebrate this Passover with his biological family. He celebrated it with his disciples. You think back in chapter 3 of Mark, when Jesus is told, hey, your mother and your brothers, they're outside. They want to they be with you. And Jesus kind of goes out of his way to make a point. He says, who are my mother and my brothers? And he looks around at his followers and say, here are my mother and my brothers. This is my spiritual family. This is my true family. And I think he's illustrating the same point here. This is my true family. Those who partake of my blood, my body. The people of God don't gather around a common family, biologically, a common ethnicity or nationality or common interests or even a common set of values. They gather around a common person, Jesus Christ, and a common sacrifice that he alone could offer. So when we think about the Lord's Supper, we think about that meal that we come together around. We gather at the meal that he instituted where we remember his sacrifice And at the same time, we reaffirm that we have entered into this covenant relationship to God and with his people. By entering this same covenant, we enter into relationship with one another. When you come to Christ and others come to Christ, you come together in the body of Christ. So the meal that we celebrate doesn't say, hey, listen, I'm God's person. I'm God's man. But it says, we are God's people. He instituted a meal for God's people to share, not just a religious rite for us to observe in isolation, but a table and a meal for us to come together to be present with one another in our common celebration of this covenant. It's not just a private spiritual experience, as Kelly taught us last week so helpfully. It's not just a common private spiritual experience. It's a corporate event. And in it, we celebrate our communion with God and with one another. Our passage ends there in verse 25. Look again at that. Jesus says, Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When Jesus observes the old Passover meal, it's like he's updating it and transforming it to this new meal that focuses now on him, the new and the final Passover lamb. But he also points forward, even past the cross, to this future feast that he's looking forward to. He says, we're going to drink it new in the kingdom of God. Elsewhere, we have him saying, I will drink it with you new in the kingdom. Isn't the kingdom already here? Hasn't he already brought the kingdom? Yes, but the kingdom is not fully consummated. It is not fully arrived. That fulfillment, that final reality, that final consummation of this relationship awaits that future day and that future feast. We're going to close with this thought. We gather as the blood-bought people of God. We gather around the lamb. We gather around his sacrifice. Through his blood, we enjoy covenant relationship with the creator. But even as we look back to his sacrifice, we at the same time look forward to the consummation. We look forward to the day when the realities that God has created are fully realized, who are fully experienced when the bride is fully cleansed and fully united to her groom, Christ Jesus. When the lamb who was slain but has been exalted to a highest place is joined with his church. That day will be marked by another feast, by more rejoicing. Listen to what what it says in Revelation 19. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, like the sound of many peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
Our meal looks back to the cross and it looks forward to this marriage supper celebration. And Jesus is the lamb. He's the lamb that we embrace. He's the lamb whose sacrifice we partake of by faith so that we may feast with him on that day. Let's pray. This has been a presentation of Castleview Church in Indianapolis, Indiana. For more information about our church, please visit castleview.org.